Thank you very much, Blake, for your talk. Um, Blake uh, talked about how he was uh, suspicious of various meditation groups and wanted to make sure he was in something legit. Um, so I want to talk about my walking into Cambridge Zen Center, which I just immediately felt at home. Um, and it was wonderful, but I had this nagging feeling because it was Korean. And what we are, we're actually a distant cousin of Rinzai, Japanese Rinzai and Korean Shogye are both descended from uh, the great Chinese master Lin Chi. So we're distant cousins of Rinzai. Um, but uh, anyway, um, so there was a, you know, there was a Japanese uh, man who was a philosophy teacher. I was teaching at Wellesley at the time. I was teaching math and his office was across the floor. And I'd heard that he'd actually spent uh, some time in a Rinzai Zen monastery. So I asked him if he'd come to Cambridge Center, Zen Center sometime when Zen Master Sung San would be visiting and let me know, is this a genuine Zen master, you know? So Zen Master Sung San was there to give a talk. He would come up once a month for a talk and a retreat. And so he was giving this talk and, you know, this um, Japanese man, philosophy teacher, professor, uh, came to listen. And then afterwards I said to him, well, is he a real Zen master? And he said, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> are there any questions? I yes. have a question. Oh. Okay, well, you're second. Okay. Um, so, like, when we're doing a practice, mm -hmm. um, like, uh, when we, like, set aside, like, 20 or so minutes to mm -hmm. just practice, should we just do choose one practice because yeah okay yeah because I, I have that in mind okay so let me I, let me speak so that people online can hear because they can't always hear yeah so the question is uh, when i'm doing my solo practice at home should i just do one practice meditation yes you should pick one meditation practice and do it for a very long time as in months or years and if it doesn't fit you'll realize it and then you just do another one but you don't jump back and forth okay um, so what I always recommend for home practice is you always start with the four great vows. And then after that, you do some kind of prostrations. I have to do chair prostrations because of my knees, but okay. You do some kind, maybe three, maybe nine, maybe 27, maybe 108. You notice these are all kind of divisors of 108, right? Um, so you, you pick a certain number of prostrations and you make sure you have some kind of cushioning under your knees. Um, and then after that, you sit. Some people like to chant the Heart Sutra. I don't, I never did. And on solo retreats, I do extra chanting, but at home, I never did chanting. But if you want to, you can do some chanting too. And then when you sit, you, um, you have one practice and you most important, and you just have this one practice and then also you have some kind of timer and you put it where you can't see it and you maybe 10 minutes maybe 15 minutes maybe 20 maybe 25 maybe 40 if you're really ambitious but whatever you set it at that's what you do you don't get up too soon you don't stay down because it feels so good it's really important because we're training ourselves to not be led around by our desires you know, pulled around here and pulled around there. We're training ourselves not to be pulled around by what feels good. And so you sit there and there might be dirty dishes in the sink and maybe there was that email you didn't send. You sit there anyway. And when the alarm gets up, you get up. And you're sitting there and maybe, oh, I'm in samadhi. This is so wonderful. When the alarm goes off, you get up. That's very important. So that's my suggestion for home practice. And 20 minutes is a very good, very good time for sitting. It's a really good, um, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's just about the right amount of time for most people. And um, yeah, and, and the regularity of it is very important to do it every day at approximately the same time, not clock time, but time in your day, like maybe before breakfast, or maybe after you, after you brush your teeth is usually before breakfast, but some people switch them. 
Um, you know, better to do it in the morning than at night, but some people can't do it in the morning. You pick some kind of schedule that you know you can sustain. That's very important. To sustain your practice is very important. You know, I've known people who get really super ambitious. They're going to get up at five in the morning and practice for two hours, and after a week they stop. So it's much better to pick something you can stick with, stick with, stick with, stick with. So thank you very much for your question. Liz, you had a question. Yes. So one feature of the quantum school, as 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 you mentioned, uh, being from Lin Chi, is the Kong on practice. Mm -hmm. okay. And then I I heard a, a daily teaching um, that uh, talked about Kong on practice that just kind of muddied the waters for me. It didn't really provide any clarity. Um, so what was said was that course the the hit um is then at that moment when when you hit you you clear everything and and you know the answer to the kong on it's just that your karma and maybe it won't come up right away maybe it comes up later may whatever but if it doesn't come up is that your karma is is kind of in the way and not allowing you access to that answer of the kong on and so what muddies the water for me on that is that, okay, this is, this is our school, the, the quantum school, and we have the Kongans and practice in a different way, but, but Rinzai practices them with a different way and maybe several different ways, depending on, on the teacher, you know, and then even within our school, there's different answers depending on the teacher. So, so it just seems kind of mystical and like, it doesn't make any sense that, that might my universal, the, 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 the Buddha nature, the universal Buddha nature knows, okay, I'm with Judy on this Kung on. So the answer is this, oh, I'm with Stan on this one. The answer is this. And if I'm in Rinzai, the answer is this. And my, my Buddha nature just knows the difference. That doesn't make any sense to me. Okay. I, so, so help on that. <laughs> what, how, how does that make sense? I don't know. Do you talk to me the same way you talk to your husband? Sometimes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we talk about mind-to-mind -mind transmission. So mind-to-mind -mind transmission means this relation to the person in front of you. So you're finding out who each other is, who each other are, who each other's are. Anyway, <laughs> you're, you're finding out this person in front of you, they are finding out this person in front of them. So Kongan is mind to mind. And it's not this cognition mind. It's this mind that's before thinking, before speech. So when you communicate with a baby, like a six month old, a nine month old, definitely pre-verbal, you, there's a real communication there, but it's not going through your cognition. So to be able to access that mind and to say your karma is in the way, that just means your habitual thoughts. That doesn't mean your deeds or your misdeeds or anything. It just means your habits of mind. So we hear something like a monk asked Zen master, uh, Joju, Zhaozhu in Chinese, does a dog have Buddha nature? And Zhaozhu said, no, which means no or has not. And then we're asked, does a dog have Buddha nature? And our habit is, well, you either have to say yes, or you have to say no, or you have to say maybe. But none of these will answer that con. So we have to cut through. Kongans are a way of cutting through the mind habits that we have that limit our possibilities, that limit our possible actions, that limit our possible perceptions, you know? Like a lot of people get really hung up on gender. Well, it has to be a boy or a girl. It has to be male or female. That's a habit of mind. And you can cut through that. And you can cut through that and the new world becomes much larger and more open. So we have all these 
things. You know, back in the 50s in, in America, you were either white or you were black. Well, that's ridiculous. <laughs> you know, there's so many people who don't fit either of those. But legally, it was written into the laws in some places. So to cut through that, to have those kind of jails that we put ourselves in, to have the, to have the, the doors open, the bars loosen, to be able to have a wide, expansive mind of many possibilities. And yeah, each kongan is pointing to something. So if you ask just a dog at Buddha nature, you're pointing to something. And maybe another school of Zen might be pointing to something else. So that becomes clear. You know, you give an answer that you think is correct because you're pointing in a certain way. And the teacher says, no, oh, okay, they're pointing somewhere else. It's always an opportunity. Every time you get a quote, wrong answer to a kongan, it's always an opportunity to open to possibilities. And we have all kinds of ways to say this, but that's in large part, not completely, but in large part, that's what kongan practice is about. It's about many, many, many things, and I could talk for hours about all the things it points to and all the things that can develop from kongan practice. Some of them perceptual, some of them psychological, many, many ways, many ways that Kung and practice can open our lives. But that's one of them. Okay? Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes. So when I'm sitting sometimes, hmm, my shadow in my mind is this. So yes, yeah, so the question is, what do you do about the chatter in your mind when you sit? Indeed. <laughs> so that's one of the wonderful things about sitting, is you don't follow that chatter. You know, to give a very simple example, you know, relating to the first question, so you're sitting there, sitting there, and suddenly you realize, oh my God, there's this email I have to send, and I didn't send it, and what should I say? But you don't get up to send that email. That's liberation. We talk about liberation all the time. That's an example of liberation, that you're not a prisoner of what my teacher used to call your backseat driver. He would say, you tell your backseat driver, shut up! You know, like that. <laughs> so, yeah. So, and, and then this question, what do I do about this? You know, like, we always want to do things. We always want to fix things. We always want to, you know, make everything correct, right? So, um, or maybe the way we want it. Maybe it's not even correct. We just want to make things the way we want it. I want to be peaceful, you know, right? Um, but that chatter, you don't have to do anything about it. Just leave it alone and bring your mind back to your practice. You know, bring your mind back, counting your breaths. Great question mantra, whatever your practice is, bring your mind back to your practice. Just keep bringing your mind back, bringing your mind back. Don't pay attention. And maybe it'll go away, maybe it won't go away, but you know, it's not controlling you. Yeah. And sometimes it quiets down. Ah, oh, very good meditation. <laughs> you know, when I was, I've sat a number of long retreats, like three, four, 190 day, uh, you know, four weeks, three weeks, 190 day retreat um, solo. And whenever I would do that, you know, the first five days or so, I become more and more peaceful. More and more peaceful. You know, like, ah, oh, samadhi. Oh, this feels so good. You know, this kind of stuff. And I knew that the retreat hadn't started yet. Because it was when that went away, and when all that stuff came roaring back, that's when the actual retreat started. We only do like, at most, two-day retreats here. Maybe one of these days we'll have a five-day retreat. We used to do that before COVID, and maybe we'll be able to start doing it again. Um, and which isn't really long enough for this process to happen, but you know, you feel more and more and more peaceful, and you know that this is an illusion or delusion, it's a delusion. And eventually that stuff that usually keep clamped down, is gonna come up. 
that's why we have we don't sleep very much on retreats you know we we start at 5 30 in the morning and we end at it used to be 9 30 but now we end at 8 30 because some people commute um so you know we we don't get a whole lot of sleep on retreats and um the there's a reason for that and the reason is when you're when you're not tired you can really keep a lid on all of that stuff but when you're tired you're not so successful and then it's not like you have to deal with the particular issue like you know this person doesn't like me and you're obsessed by this person not like me it's not like you deal with that issue what you deal with what what happens is you learn to not let that stuff control you so it comes up and it's not controlling you that's that's what happens so it's not like you're going to solve your problems by sitting in a retreat because oh i can see now what's going on it's more like you can see that you can't see and that it doesn't have to control you and that there's something more fundamental in your life that you can rely on that's not connected to your ideas and your feelings and your desires that's what it's about so yeah thank you for your question your demons are your friends <laughs> Yeah. Are there any other questions? I have a question. Yes. I just heard about this uh, word kashanti. It's, it's the paramita of endurance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, how do you practice kashanti? How do you not practice it? Endurance, perseverance is another way to put it. You know? You just keep going, you just keep going, you just keep going. That's all. You don't run away. That's Kshanti. Okay? Thank you. Yeah, retreats are all about endurance. <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So it's time for announcements.